Welcome to this talk sponsored by the Institute of World Politics. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We offer a doctoral program, seven master's degree programs, including two online MAs and 18 certificates of graduate study. To support the work of IWP, please visit iwp.edu slash donate. Today, we will be hearing from Mrs. Maria Yucheska, who will deliver a lecture entitled On the Road to Killing Fields, Russian Propaganda in Poland, a, a humanitarian perspective. Um, Mrs. Maria Yucheska is a communication specialist with a versatile international experience for education in linguistics, culture studies, and international affairs combined with years of living abroad makes her point of view unique and comprehensive. Mrs. Yuszczeska worked for the Kosciuszko Chair of Polish Studies from 2014 to 2020, and she is a graduate of IWP's MA program. At present, she is working on her PhD in political philosophy. Please welcome Mrs. Maria Yuszczeska. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure for me to welcome you at the lecture entitled On the Road to Killing Fields, Russian Propaganda in Poland, a humanitarian perspective. At this point, uh, we have 4.7 million Ukrainian refugees in Poland. All those people came since February 2022, when the conflict in Ukraine escalated into what is now called, according to the Russian propaganda, as the special military operation. The fate of the Ukrainian refugees in Poland and their future fate are of vital, vital concern to the Polish population. This is why I am very happy to lead you through my lecture. Is Russia a military superpower? We are unable to assess it without the access to the intelligence data. However, we may make some extrapolation of battlefield data and combine it with historical knowledge to get quite accurate um, image of the situation and potential developments in the Ukrainian war. Certainly, there are powers that have access to full data, but even without it, we are able to, um, to judge the situation and make some assumptions also regarding the future of Ukraine and especially Ukrainian citizens. Even if we are not able to say if Russia is back to its uh, military prowess from the times of the Cold War, we can certainly say that it still uses propaganda as a tool projecting its superpower. Russia has had uh, been using um, propaganda and disinformation for hundreds of years as a tool of its statecraft. At present, due to the advent of the internet and, Ill, and limitless possibilities of influence that the internet offers to uh, Russian secret services, both uh, in terms of domestic audience and of foreign audiences, the possibilities of influencing um, through propaganda and disinformation uh, are also uh, much larger than in the times of um, the Cold War or before. Certainly, we may say that propaganda and disinformation are tool, um, tools in the information war, and they serve tactical and strategic goals. There appear multiple narrations directed at different audiences, um, at different audiences which may result in, contra in contradictions, that, but even if those narrations are contradictory, they are there to achieve coordinated goals. For, um, for insightful observers of the political scene and of the developments of, uh, on the Ukrainian-Russian front, um, these um, pieces of information and disinformation may bring additional insights uh, as to what is going to happen in humanitarian terms. And these are those tiny bits of information here and there weaved into the larger narrative of human uh, of, um, uh, of the Russian propaganda and disinformation that are a sign that are a worrying sign to me 
and um, this is those um, elements that I would like to highlight in this presentation. What we need to understand from the very beginning is that Russian disinformation and propaganda are not fake news. This is the most um, common association with Russian uh, disinformation, but the true disinformation and propaganda are more complex tools that are used um, by the Russian state to influence domestic and foreign audiences. The five pillars of uh, disinformation and propaganda are official government communications, state-funded global messaging, cultivation of proxy sources, weaponization of social media, and cyber-enabled disinformation. Naturally, in Poland, we face much more cultivation of proxy sources, weaponization of social media, and cyber-enabled disinformation. However, Whatever information is planted on the Polish internet or, um, or exerted on the Polish uh, populace by the sources of Russian influence, we still have to be aware of the official government communications and state-funded global messaging of the Russian state to have the full picture of um, propaganda images that they're trying to build among their own audience, among the Ukrainians, and in the Western countries. War in Ukraine was certainly a litmus test, allowing to check how efficient the Putin's regime is in reconstructing the power uh, that they would like to reconstruct and to rebuild the Russia as powerful as the Soviet Union used to be. This is the constant aim of um, uh, ever since President Putin uh, has been in office to reassert the position in Russia as the regional and global power. Special military operation was another step on the, on the road to building power in the region and in design of, um, of, the, Rus of the Russian authorities, it was supposed to be a short operation that would um, engulf half of Ukraine and gain um, and gain the support of the Ukrainians themselves, who are supposed to welcome Russian troops with flowers and be very happy to be again in the fold of the Russian-speaking empire. Meanwhile, um, the war in Ukraine proved a quite different reality. Uh, to the disbelieving eyes of the Russian public and Russian authorities. First of all, the special military operation didn't go as um, smoothly as planned, and the advances of the Russian troops are not as spectacular. On top of it, the heroes of the special military operation, the Russian soldiers, are not welcomed with flowers at all, and people clearly state to the Russian invaders that they are considered invaders, that the Ukrainians want to be a separate autonomous country, that they do not feel affinity to the Russian power, and that they feel attacked. Due to the widespread uh, use of social media and uh, cellular phones, uh, we um, became witnesses of the horrific war crimes that were filmed uh, by the Ukrainian civilians and that were filmed by the Ukrainian troops after they uh, recaptured the terrains from which Russian forces retreated. So we may safely say that the special military operation has so far not been going according to plan. What might come as a surprise uh, to, um, to players in the region, the Ukraine, as consolidated as a separate and autonomous, and autonomous country, and Ukrainians have a clear will to uh, fight till the end for their autonomy. With regards to the response of the Western powers, um, this response is quite unequivocal. They are willing to support Ukraine with uh, military training and, and arms, even very expensive and um, high-tech army, 
and, and, and I'm sorry, and high, high tech arm, arms. <laughs> However, they are unwilling to get involved politically. The response of Poland as the border country of the European Union was exquisite. Poles, um, within very short period since February, uh, accommodated more than 4.7 million Ukrainian refugees, hosting them mostly in their own homes. Uh, I, I wrote at length about that in an article pub published uh, on IWP website. However, um, I would like to stress here that for Poland, this crisis is first of all a humanitarian crisis. And I believe that this is the way we should see it. It's not um, as much a war as a humanitarian crisis, which was produced at will. And I believe that focusing on the humanitarian and human aspect of this conflict is a good way to shift the narration, which is at this point uh, badly needed. What we have to understand about propaganda and disinformation about um, in this conflict is that it is much more steeped in history than we could um, initially suspect. Of course, Russia is um, narrating this conflict as an uh, as another episode of Cold War in which Russia, like Soviet Union, is facing NATO countries and um, European Union and, of course, the United States. Uh, and again, Russia feels threatened and encircled uh, by the very fact of existence of NATO. Meanwhile, there are other um, prominent narratives who are um, more readable to the inhabitants of Central Europe, uh, but which need to be um, which need to be made clear uh, to fully understand the extent of uh, Russian propaganda and disinformation in Poland. For instance, many narratives go back to the times of the Second World War. Uh, where the motives of uh, allegedly Nazi Ukraine is coming from, as well as all the narratives regarding Poland being left to the mercy of the victorious Russia if they help Ukraine. Of course, um, this narrative assumes that uh, Poles will think about the times of um, the um, of the Second World War when Poland was attacked by Germany and the Soviet Union and um, practically partitioned between the Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union in spite of the alliances it had with France and Great Britain. Not to mention another 50 years of Soviet occupation after the Yalta agreements when again uh, the matter of Poland was not um, was not of primary concern to the victorious allies, in uh, in spite of high high hopes of Poles who were very much engaged in the military activities uh, against uh, Nazi Germany on all the fronts of the Second World War. There are also older narratives that harken back to the times of Bolshevik Russia or even times beforehand when um, um, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was the largest country in Europe in the 16th century and was a considerable uh, European power which spanned much farther east uh, than at present. Another important um, point of Russian propaganda, and, and this is a, a very important myth to the bank, uh, is the alleged uh, unity of uh, Russia and Ukraine dating back to the origins of the um, of the uh, Russian state, which the Russians claimed had place in Kievian Rus. And um, this is very important to elucidate for the American audience, which tends to be uh, rather a historical audience, namely, Kievian Rus was the the origin at the beginning of um, of the uh, second um, of the second millennium uh, of um, present day Ukraine. However, the beginning of the present 
of the present-day Russia is not Kievian Rus, it's the Muscovite Rus, which is uh, much farther east. And this is not only a geographical distinction, it's also a cultural distinction, because Kievian Rus fell under the um, cultural influence of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth and was westernized uh, through the institution of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Meanwhile, Muscovite Rus fell under the influence of the Mongol Empire and was acculturated in an oriental way, which is responsible for many features of the present-day Russia, including uh, the um, formidable cruelty of the Russian soldiers in this war. So this is just to remind you, this is the uh, space occupied by the um, Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And as you can uh, clearly see, the, uh, the area of present-day Poland, which is, which is approximately here, is not at all the area of the first Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which spread from Baltic Sea to the Black Sea and much farther east than at present. So what are the chosen narratives that uh, Russian uh, propaganda um, and disinformation builds in Poland? First of all, there is the narrative of the recolonization of Eastern Europe. And in light of what I have just said, it's quite understandable. Although at the first sight, it, um, it may seem quite absurd to, um, to um, the Western audience, because one of the narratives is that Poland is trying to usurp half of Ukraine and to um, annex its territory. Of course, to somebody who is not familiar with the history of the region, this seems quite a ridiculous claim. Nevertheless, to those nations who inhabit this part of the world and remember the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, this may sound at least plausible. There is also another version of this uh, of this uh, myth with um, of this narrative. Uh, with an anti-Jewish spike, uh, uh, with an anti-Jewish spin, which says that America is trying to build heavenly Jerusalem in the territory of Ukraine for um, for the Jews who will soon be unable to live in Israel because they provoked a lot of internal and external conflicts in that area. So this is quite characteristic for. Um, for Russian propaganda to inflame ethnic differences and to exploit anti-Semitism to build its own narration. So this is one group of topics that uh, is appearing as uh, propaganda on the Polish internet. There is another, um, another narrative related to the difficult history of uh, Poland and Ukraine related to Poland being um, before, um, before um, in the time before the First World War in the times of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, as well as after the First World War in the times of the Second Polish Republic, uh, being a multi-ethnic country, and this multi-ethnic country, which was in, in which um, involved. Uh, a part of the present-day Ukrainian territories uh, had its own um, had its own um, um, Polish population, but also Ukrainian population and Belarusian population and Jewish population. So this was a multi-ethnic um, multi-ethnic uh, country, and Polish and Ukrainian population in the um, Pol Pol in the eastern voivod ships of the Second Polish Republic um, were living in peace. Meanwhile, um, after the, the Second World War broke out in uh, 1943, um, the nationalist Ukrainian sentiments escalated in that region and uh, uh, an ethnic cleansing of the Polish population was organized there by um, SS and the uh, Ukrainian 
nationalists um, uh, whose main ideologue was Stepan Bandera. That's why um, the name of this strain of narratives would, would be for me roughly Bandera lovers. Uh, in that ethnic cleansing, um, approximately 120,000 uh, 120, Poles were killed. And the methods that were used to um, murder them were very primitive. Usually uh, it was all taking place in the countryside. So all kinds of uh, countryside equipment and tools that um, were used to uh, take lives. And uh, in terms of um, horrific things that happened uh, during the Second World War, the ethnic cleansing of Poles in Polonia certainly uh, was one of, of the most horrible ones. Uh, and this topic has always been a sensitive topic after Poland regained independence um, uh, in 1989. And um, curiously enough, uh, because this topic was quiet and unresolved in the diplomatic uh, relations between Poland and Ukraine, it is still an open wound in uh, many in many Polish milieus, and as such, it is ready uh, to be exploited by Russian propaganda. And um, the spike of in, of um, pieces of information about um, the ethnic cleansing of the Poles in Bolivia um, started not in 2022, but already in 2014. And before the, Pol the Poles were quite unaware of this topic, much to the chagrin of, of uh, the descendants of people who escaped that massacre, uh, who, has al who had always been advocating for more attention being paid to the problem of, uh, of, of the ethnic cleansing Poles in Polonia in the Polish-Ukrainian uh, diplomatic um, relations. But um, their voices were not uh, often heard. Meanwhile, suddenly, when the uh, when the Russians attacked Ukraine in 2014, when they annexed Crimea, um, there was a visible spike of um, the news about the Volynia massacre on the Polish internet. And uh, ever since, it has been a much larger topic on the Polish internet. So um, again, Russian propaganda and disinformation is using uh, ethnic conflicts uh, to inflame present-day relations between the countries, um, to praise the uh, maturity of the new generation of the Poles. Many people in Poland are aware of the fact that this topic has not been diplomatically resolved and that there are many people who uh, treat Bandera as a national hero in Ukraine. However, Poles are not willing to uh, not help the Ukrainians because of that. So in spite of, of the difficult past that um, our two nations have, uh, Poles are very welcoming to the refugees and they are, um, uh, they are hosting people in their own homes. They're going to, um, to much length to help them out uh, to adapt in Poland. And I believe that the popular sentiment is that this is a tragedy that happened to uh, our grandfathers, but we will have time to talk about it later when the war is over. So in this regard, Russian propaganda doesn't seem to be uh, too successful in this narrative. Then we have uh, the narrative of the betrayal of the, of the West, which is a veiled threat, namely if Poland uh, gets involved in helping Ukraine and Ukrainian refugees, because this aspect is very important, that helping Ukrainian refugees is also seen as an act of enmity towards Russia, uh, it will be punished once um, Russia is victorious, because for sure Poland is going to be left to its own devices, just as it was left to its own devices in 1939 and, and in 1945, uh, after the Yalta conference. Uh, so this, these are narratives that, um, that are feeding on the fears of Poles that um, 
that still very much feel the, the trauma of the Second World War when Poland lost almost one third of its population and um, to whom the, um, the poverty and terrible living conditions of the Soviet bloc are still very much uh, a living memory. Then we have the um, two more uh, and more, I would say, personal anti-Ukrainian anti-Ukrainian narratives, namely uh, migration related myths, so to say. So these are uh, claims about Ukrainians taking different things away from Poles, like uh, Ukrainians stealing jobs from Poles, stealing social benefits and child support, even stealing partners from the Poles when the tale of beautiful, home-loving Ukrainian women willing to uh, be only housewives, uh, allegedly stealing boyfriends and husbands from Polish women who are allegedly emancipated and very demanding, but not very willing to sacrifice their own goals for the goals of their husbands, is a, a very much um, a pedal is very much a peddled story, um, as well as news about uh, Ukrainians stealing places in hospitals, in schools, being generally ungrateful and lazy as well as um, as the narratives that I would um, call ethnic slurs, because these are, first of all, slurs and swear words with regards to Ukrainians that are aimed to build tension on the internet and aggressive behavior to mount up aggress ag aggressive emotions, as well as um, alleged um, as claims that this or another Polish politician is of Ukrainian background, which is supposed to be a negative feature of, of this and other politician. And of course, uh, there, is, um, there is one narrative that I would include in ethnic slurs, but this is a narrative which really chills, my, chills blood in my veins, namely the mentions of Ukrainians being filthy, and carrying diseases, uh, which which is precisely what Goebbels was um, ascribing to the Jews during the Second World War, uh, when the German populace was being prepared for the persecution and elimination of the Jews. So this line of thinking among the Russian elites that, uh, that tried to sell this narrative in the surrounding countries, uh, is really troubling to me because one thing is to uh, one thing is to feed on um, different national fears related to history, uh, but other thing is to repeat verbatim um, the propaganda claims that were already used um, in preparation for genocide. So what are the main aims of those narratives being, uh, being injected in the Polish information sphere? And here it needs to be mentioned that it's not only the internet, we also have um, other sources of influence. So certain politicians are definitely under the influence of Russian propaganda and some of them are the members of the um, Polish parliament. We also have um, agents of influence or front organizations that are peddling this propaganda to the, to the Polish people, uh, often under the guise of, um, of good intentions. Um, so um, many organizations are um, infused with those narratives by people who are not um, a really willing cooperators of the Russian regime, but um, people who are genuinely interested in helping the Ukrainians, but at the same time susceptible to um, narratives, to, to negative narratives that are circulated about them. So there are tactical and strategic goals of this propaganda and tactical ones are a temporary change of the mood of Polish populace, and it's usually correlated with um, with um, failures at the front 
of the Russian forces. So whenever there is some major or spectacular failure on uh, of the Russians on the front, uh, there is a spike of anti-Ukrainian messages on the Polish internet. So the tactical aim is to shape perceptions, to make Russia seem more successful than it is, and to make Ukrainians seem uh, less uh, less less pleasant and uh, less cooperative than they are. So, so these are like short-term goals. But the long-term goals of Russian uh, propaganda and disinformation in the, Pol in the Polish information sphere are um, um, to isolate Poland in the European Union, to undermine its position in NATO, um, to divide Poland and the Ukraine by shaping perceptions of, um, of those uh, ethnicities inside Poland, to undermine domestic situation in Poland, to isolate the Ukrainians and to dehumanize the Ukrainians. And those two last, um, uh, those two last goals are, um, are truly worrying. But the coordinated aim of all those activities is to uh, ultimately mispresent the human-centered Polish perspective, to mispresent it in the eyes of the Poles themselves and also on the international arena. And um, this is a very clever, um, this is a very clever way of, uh, and this is a very uh, clever type of influence and um, it's a very interesting one related to some long-term activities uh, of the Russian uh, propaganda in Poland and that's why I uh, I would like to mention it in particular because uh, the anti-migration stance of Polish government has been widely known in Europe and uh, and also in in America and Polish government has been criticized for being, um, let's say, migration skeptical. Uh, meanwhile, um, and this is why, the massive, massive help of the, of the Polish populace to the Ukrainians, and I would like to remind here about the 4.7 million Ukrainian refugees in Poland uh, in private homes, mostly in private homes, uh, or or um, or in rented flats that are somehow subsidized by private poles. Um, it's it's worth mentioning here because this came as a surprise that that poles took all those people in because there was a consistent um, consistent um, narrative about pole, poles being anti-migration. And this narrative was certainly reinforced by the crisis produced on the Polish-Belarusian border um, um, in uh, early summer, excuse me, 2021, when suddenly migrants from the Middle East appeared on the Belarusian border, shipped in planes to Minsk and getting from Minsk to the border, claiming that they need asylum in, in Poland uh, because this is the first country of the European Union that they're trying to enter. And this migrant crisis caused, um, caused um, a very radical reaction of the Polish government uh, who decided that they are not letting the migrants in because they cannot verify their identity they cannot exclude the possibility that uh, these are attempts at infiltration of foreign agents and that simply were skeptical uh, because of the um, profile of the migrants, namely th these were predominantly young males. And the, the Polish government stance was that ref war refugees are predominantly the vulnerable people. So uh, women, children, and the elderly. And it was proved right when the war in the Ukraine broke out, when it was mostly women and children and the elderly who presented themselves on the Polish border. 
uh, oftentimes accompanied by the husbands or, or the fathers who would just escort women and children to the border and go back to Ukraine to fight. Um, nevertheless, the, the crisis on the on the on the Polish Belarusian border, which lasted throughout the summer and throughout fall and and uh, receded a little um, in in winter, uh, produced the 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 uh, uh, numerous effects. Namely, it, it divided Poles inside Poland because some of them supported the actions of the government and some supported uh, the migrants uh, and wanted to help them, which, which is understandable, of course. Secondly, it um, perpetuated the image of Poland uh, as migrant skeptical force and led to the actions of the European Union that ended in in uh, the proposals to punish Poland financially, precisely at the moment when more than 4 million people uh, in Poland need help. More than 4 million true refugees are in Poland. Meanwhile, the, pro the, the procedures and, and um, lengthy, um, I, I would say lengthy san sanction producing process is at the point where uh, it want it wants to sanction Poland for its anti-migration stance, for which the argument was the crisis produced on the on the Polish Belarusian border in two thousand in two thousand twenty one. So uh, this is a very important aspect of uh, Russian propaganda and disinformation. It not only uh, it not only produces fake news and it not only uh, infuses the internet with certain type uh, of co with certain types of content. It also resorts to very um, very real sting operation, uh, sting operations of various kinds, and um, and this crisis, of course, abetted by the uh, by the regime in Minsk. But uh, naturally, uh, this wouldn't be possible without uh, Russian help. Um, is a very, very real aspect of this war. It's not only about uh, about fake news and about influence on the internet. It's uh, sometimes a, a very much sophisticated and long-term goals that are being introduced through different kinds of, of masking activities. And uh, naturally, the long the long term goals of all all that uh, operation, apart from tying a part of Polish policy forces on on another border, uh, was uh, the twofold preparation for the Ukrainian war, the isolation of Poland on the international arena, because it's clear that Poland is the country of contact for U Ukrainian refugees, so the more difficult uh, the situation of the Polish government inside of the European Union is going to be, uh, the less efficient Poland is going to be in helping Ukrainian refugees. And in the ultimate goal of intimidating Ukrainian populace, the fact that the refugees have nowhere to go is an important point for Russian propaganda. Uh, luckily, it, it didn't play out this way, but certainly it was one of uh, the assumptions uh, in fabricating the crisis uh, on the Polish-Belarusian border. And of course, uh, all those events on the border in summer 2021 provoked anti-migration vibe in Poland and also some anti-government reactions of, of those who want to help immigrants and of, uh, of those who want to help migrants. And of course, this is, again, understandable. So what all those um, activities of Russian and of Russian propaganda and disinformation um, are telling us about the future fate of the Ukrainians? Uh, first, first of all, we can see that uh, in, in all those narratives uh, that Russia is, is trying to, um, to achieve and probably quite successfully 
uh, the course of events in which uh, Ukraine is going to be forced uh, to um, to enter into some sort of peace negotiations. For now, it looks like uh, this conflict may turn into a long-term war of attrition, but because sanctions are not working uh, very much uh, in favor of the European Union economies, uh, many uh, governments inside of the European Union would like to shorten this uh, um, special military operation. So there is a lot of pressure on uh, on Kiev to enter into the negotiations. And, uh, and as a result, um, I would say that um, Russian propaganda is quite successful in, in pushing for the acceptance of the overall narrative of, of this war. Meanwhile, both solutions the pro prolonged uh, war of attrition, especially in view of the winter, which is going to be certainly severe uh, on Ukrainians because uh, with no central heating and no electricity, they may simply freeze to death with no military intervention whatsoever needed to achieve the goal. Or in with the peace negotiations, um, the prospects for the for 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 the for the populace of Ukraine are really bleak, and the overall image of a subhuman Ukrainian unworthy of his own country, language, and culture and life, which is circulating on the Russian internet and which is, is certainly used as a weapon on the Ukrainian um, uh, internet to undermine uh, the spirit and the morale of, of the Ukrainian people uh, is a very troubling narrative. On top of that, special military operation um, sounds familiar to those who um, know about the ethnic cleansing operations organized by the Soviet Union in the second half of the 1930s um, of the 20th century. Those ethnic cleansing operations began with the ethnic and with the with the so-called German operation, which was really the ethnic cleansing operation. Namely, it it was to remove the German, um, as they were called, the German subjects from the territory of the Soviet Union. However, the so-called Polish operation of the NKVD uh, targeted Poles, and this was. Uh, not at all about the removal of the Poles, it was about the mass murder of the Poles. And as a result of, um, of, this, um, of this operation, it is estimated that possibly up to 200,000 Polish, uh, Polish uh, Poles in the Soviet Union, they were of course Soviet citizens, but of Polish origin and of uh, Polish uh, cultural profile, and disappeared. Um, the men were targeted and arrested, tortured and murdered. And as a result of the loss of the breadwinners, the Polish families, families in the Soviet Union collapsed and uh, women and children uh, and the elderly, again, like in the case of the Ukrainian crisis, were most vulnerable and either died out or did everything they could to hide their Polish identity. So within two years, this, this ethnic cleansing operation um, was done and the Polish um, Poles were eradicated as an ethnic group uh, from the face of the Soviet Union. So this is very telling that um, this, um, what is read as a war in Ukraine uh, by the West is called special military operation uh, by the Russians. And it needn't at all be um, a cheap attempt at hiding the true um, reality of, of this conflict. Of, it, it needn't be an attempt at hiding the war, so to say. It might really be uh, an operation like the Soviet-style ethnic cleansing operations of the 1930s. 
and I would I would really um, put some more thought to that topic, especially that because because the Soviets uh, the Russian soldiers are using NKVD methods. They are targeting civilian population. They are destroying civilian targets and crucial infrastructure, and uh, they are targeting civilians um, in the most horrible way, aimed at intimidation, NKVD style, tortures, violence, rape to subjugate, extermination. Another thing uh, that um, made me wonder about uh, the true the, the the true aim of the special military operation and uh, and the true aim of what the West is believing to be a war um, is the fact that mobile crematoria followed the Russian troops. We know that uh, Russian authorities assume that this is going to be a short three uh, three day long operation. Um, that they were assuming that they will have um, quick territorial gains and that this is going to be a very successful move. So who did they need the mobile crematoria for? Who were they for? Naturally, there, there are also um, the factors produced par partly by uh, Russian propaganda in, in Ukraine and of course by, by the uh, situation, the geopolitical situation in which Ukraine is a country on the border of NATO, which very much would like to westernize itself, but um, is actively forbidden by Russia to do it, uh, namely the sense of impending doom. There is a, a conscious activity on the part of uh, Russia to dampen the morale of the Ukrainians, and they are um, they are treated and referred to in really subhuman terms. Uh, this is also visible in, in, you know, in the intercepts of of uh, the talks of the Russian soldiers between themselves and and with their families in Russia, and this um, sub the notion of Ukrainians being uh, subhumans is very much present in the Russian sphere of influence, which would which should really make the Western governments wonder what is going to happen if any kind of armistice is conducted and any part of Ukraine is going to fall under the uh, Russian governance. And of course, we have to think about the, um, about the crucial factor in that part of the world. Um, and this was already um, experienced by Napoleon, uh, namely, if the winter is harsh, all the all the people are going to be targeted by weather and um, the influence um, and activities of the Russian soldiers are not going to be needed anyway, because without heating and, and, sun and electricity, people are not very likely to survive in uh, low temperatures. What I want to point out in my presentation as well is um, the definition of uh, the Soviet Union elaborated by uh, IWP professor, Professor uh, John J. Ziak in his book, um, A History of the KGB Czechisty. Uh, he defined uh, there Russia as a counterintelligence state. And that is the state whose sole aim is the perpetuation of interests of its governing elites, which originate in secret services, in counterintelligence. So the nature, the nature of Russia has not changed uh, much since the Soviet times. Russian elites are still very much permeated by counterintelligence. Uh, the president of Russia himself is a former uh, KGB, um, KGB officer. And uh, the ruling elites of Russia are permeated by counterintelligence influence. So we may safely assume that uh, the methods of operation uh, of yours still apply. So uh, I, I would be of opinion that the Argo of counterintelligence forces of Russia that tells them to refer to 
um, the war in Ukraine as special military operation is not a coincidence. And I, and I would really refer to other special operations of, uh, of the former um, Soviet Union uh, secret services to find a point of reference and to, and to find um, and, and to make some anticipations regarding the future uh, of Ukrainians in Ukraine. And naturally, uh, it is quite evident on the basis of uh, what I have already said about the disinformation and propaganda uh, of the Russian state in, in Poland, that propaganda and disinformation are, are still used as tools of statecraft. And here, I, I would also like to mention a, a global aspect of, of propaganda and disinformation as tools of statecraft, namely, all over the world, not only in in Europe or in or and in, in Poland in particular, but also in the United States, uh, the accounts uh, on the internet that were busy um, distributing um, distributing uh, vaccine skeptical content um, in the era um, in the period of pandemic after uh, the war in Ukraine escalated in, in February 2022, started to, um, to dis disseminate uh, anti-Ukrainian content, pro-Russian content. So we can clearly see that certain, certain sources of influence are cultivated to long-term, to undermine stability of societies in the West and that by virtue of being over the ocean and the United States is not at all safe from, uh, from this influence because the accounts that were uh, peddling anti-vaccine uh, anti content uh, in, the, in the times of the pandemia are now uh, busying themselves in the anti-Ukrainian propaganda. How come, um, how come there is anti-Ukrainian content uh, um, in America? If, if, um, if this was not such an important topic of public debate beforehand. And so this is only to, to make you wonder about how uh, long-term strategy of Soviet propaganda works. It's not only about fake news. It's about, um, it's about destabilizing societies and, and uh, building sentiments of uh, whole ethnic groups, uh, which doesn't take a minute. It takes lo a long time and, and um, Russians are quite, proficient at uh, doing this because they have been doing this for many years before internet. Is Russian propaganda successful? Certainly it is successful in terms of framing the narrative. We are still considering the war in Ukraine as, as war, as um, a legitimate conflict in which we have two warring sides. We're talking about war crimes and uh, we are building a reality in which the laws of war apply. Meanwhile, uh, this is really blocking the options for uh, the Western countries. Because if, if uh, we assume that this is a war, then all that is left to us is to enter into peace negotiations. Meanwhile, if we try to shift this perspective and reframe the narrative, uh, we may have some other options uh, open. Uh, what else? Certainly there is, as a result of this narration of, of this conflict being another episode of the Cold War um, and a conflict between Russia and non-Russia, Russia and NATO, um, this isolates very much uh, this part of Europe, which is between the old countries of NATO and Russia. 
the new countries of the European of the new countries of NATO and European Union feel very much threatened by those uh, narratives. And uh, Russia is very effectively undermining uh, trust inside NATO, uh, especially that uh, certain um, moves of the Department of Defense um, in and public enunciations of, of American officials were not taken very well in, in the countries of, on the border of NATO. Um, so in, in those, um, in regard of isol isolationism uh, in the post-Soviet zone, Russia seems to be quite successful too. Of course, we have a demonstration of power through annexation. This is also an element of propaganda. And a very important factor for me, because I'm mostly interested in, in the humanitarian problems, is the preparation of the international audience for the killing field. We are getting used to the methods that um, Russian soldiers are using against the civilians. We are getting used to the fact that civilian population is targeted. We are getting used to the fact that um, Russian soldiers are building strongholds in strategic uh, points of the infrastructures, uh, even if this is quite uh, a horrific idea, like, um, like the case of the nuclear plant in Zaporozhye, which is, uh, uh, which is um, being turned into a, into a regular military base. And as such, this is going to be an untouchable stronghold because who would risk shelling a nuclear plant? So this is what is happening. The Russia through its narrative is normalizing the abnormal. And although we are being shocked but by all what we can see, thanks to the internet access and, and the films of um, of regular Ukrainian citizens being made av available on the internet, uh, we are still very much influenced by this narrative. So what we have to remember uh, is that those who frame the narrative win the um, information war. So what we have to do is to we need to reframe the narrative. So certainly. Um, there are signs that this is not a cold war. We have casualties. There is war going on. The Ukrainians are losing some uh, areas and then they are reclaiming them. The Russians are retreating. Um, so uh, this is not a cold conflict by any means. And what and um, possibly, um, as I suggested earlier, this needn't be seen as war at all. This might be seen as well as an uh, ethnic cleansing operation, operation organized um, outside of the border of your own country uh, by the troops that work on behalf of counterintelligence state. It really needn't be a war. Uh, so if um, if we stop seeing this as a war, uh, we may have other avenues open to us. For instance, the avenue of humanitarian presence, in, uh, of humanitarian presence in Ukraine. So uh, we may assume that uh, if, um, if there is some sort of armistice, and for instance, the armistice um, is going to um, assume the previous border of Ukraine, as it used to be before um, the aggression of the aggression of uh, Russia on Ukraine and uh, with Crimea and, and the east of Ukraine belonging still to Ukraine, um, NATO would just have to establish strong humanitarian presence there and make sure that the units, um, the, the humanitarian outfits are um, well defended and that they, that they are really unviolable. So there, there is an avenue um, uh, in line with uh, the Hague Conventions and international law, which allows for the presence of forces 
that are stabilizing the situation, and this need not be at all military forces or even NATO forces. We can build humanitarian presence, which would be um, so well fortified and, and so crucial for, uh, for the peace in the region that all the, all the parties involved would be interested in, in keeping it there. <clears throat> what may serve as a good point of reference in the, in the past is, um, is the war in Korea. I believe much, much more than, uh, than the Cold War. Because like in the case of war in Korea, we have um, two uh, partners of communist provenance working to push out America from its sphere of influence. So now Russia is not the senior, but the junior partner. And China is, is the senior partner because without the opening of, uh, mar of, of Chinese market to Russian trade, the Western suction, sanctions would um, work properly. So we have this um, this play of, of multiple players, and this is not at all this is not at all about Ukraine or or Europe for that matter. It is about the balance of power in the world. So if we use the uh, Korean War as a point of reference, we may well remember that uh, America saw itself as a policing force in the area, not at all as a warring side or, or an enabler of a, of a warring side. Th the Americans treated Korean War um, as a policing operation, so to say. So if we come against um, special military operation, uh, we may as well have a narrative regarding an operation on the Western side. And certainly America is a key player here that can change the course of this narration. Um, we can of course propose a number of uh, humanitarian, um, of humanitarian um, activities that can be conducted in the area uh, with a big argument for humanitarian action being the security uh, food security of the world, because lack of um, of food provisions from Ukraine may mean hunger in many parts of the world, which in in turn are going to be destabilized by hunger, and this may provoke a number of um, consequences both for Africa, Middle East, and Western Europe, as well as prevention of mass murder and ethnic cleansing. And this is also a vital humanitarian concern. We should, we should um, truly reason with that in mind, that there is a, an ethnic cleansing in the making. There are signs in the Russian propaganda that this can turn in that direction if it is not stopped. And if we are willing to reframe the narration, and uh, stop using the Russian Cold, Cold War narration as our guideline, we may open new avenues for solving of this conflict. And I sincerely believe that the bravery of the Ukrainian people deserves it, as well as, as, um, as the future stability of not only Europe, but the whole world because Ukrainian destabilized and you, um, Ukraine destabilized and Ukrainian ruined, ruined and destroyed has global uh, ramifications in many continents. So please think about this conflict as more um, like Korean War than the Cold War and think about different solutions than the inevitable solution uh, proposed here to far, um, uh, here to far, um, by the uh, Russian side of this conflict. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope that my presentation 
provided much uh, food for thought and also some source of hope. Have a great evening.